This is Reaganism, a podcast dedicated to exploring where the Reagan movement lives today. I'm Roger Zak. I'm your host, director of the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. On this episode of Reaganism, Roger sits down with Tom Shanker, who is currently the director of the Project for Media and National Security at the George Washington University. Earlier in his career, he was a Moscow correspondent for the Chicago Tribune during Mikhail Gorbachev's rise through the collapse of the Soviet Union. In light of Gorbachev's recent passing, Roger and Tom reflect on his legacy, as well as on events in Russia today. Tom Shanker, welcome to the show. Roger, thanks for inviting me. I'm honored to be joining you. It's great to reconnect with you. Uh, You're known widely as a former, I guess now, uh, New York Times reporter, at least within Washington and New York Times readers across the country and the world. Many years doing the uh, Pentagon beat and then later editor for Pentagon and broader national security issues, perhaps beyond that as well. Today, you are at George Washington University where you are a director for the project for media and national security. Migrating from the world of being the journalist to now being the, I don't know, academic or being an academic institution looking at uh, what you did. Which seat do you like better, Tom? Well, I like all three of them, Roger. I think you you can divide your life into three categories. Learn, where you're learning what you need to do earn to provide for your family and then return and i'm now in the return phase where i hope that my decades being a national security correspondent and editor allow me to run programs host guests and conversations that elevate the national security debate in a, in a calm way especially in a very polarized environment where where fake news is not a joke but is for real we are trying to combat that with every session that i host Well, we will definitely get into that in our conversation, and I can think of no one better qualified and suited to take on that role than you, Tom. Of course, we got to know each other back when I was just a little staffer on the Armed Services Committee, and I had the good fortune of meeting you because you decided to cover one of our subcommittee hearings, which was, uh, you know, a bit of a surprise to all of us, and we were excited about it as well because when you work to create these hearings, you want someone to pay attention other than the members and witnesses. So uh, decades later, Tom, uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Well, that's very kind. And one thing I learned back when I was first a police reporter in Oklahoma City is pay attention to everybody up and down the chain of of command. Interviewing leadership is important, but the staff people who do all the hard work, they're the ones you really want to talk to. And I'll probably embarrass you because your father, Dove, was, of course, a very important national security official. And I asked, I always used to tell him, Dove, you're only the second smartest. Zach. Ah. <laughs> well, uh, we do appreciate you telling that to my dad. <laughs> That's great. Well, Tom, we have you here today, not because of our long history together, but for a role or or, or something you did earlier in your career when you uh, were a correspondent for the Chicago Tribune when Miguel Mikhail Gorb- Gorbachev was actually uh, leading the Soviet Union, and you were there uh, from that time through its collapse. You wrote a, a wonderful essay after Gorbachev piece recently passed, and really that's where I wanted to, to begin the conversation. Tell us about Soviet Union, Russia, that you were in back when Gorbachev was leading the Politburo, uh, your impressions, and just what was it like to be a correspondent for a major American daily? I mean, you've obviously reflected on that uh, with Gorbachev's recent passing. Right. No, it's true. I I came in with Gorbachev in 85 and left when the Soviet Union was no more in early 92. And Roger, when I I got there, the Soviet Union, it was deep in the Cold War. Uh, It was very hard to even talk to average Russians on the street because obviously my Russian was proficient, but I had an American accent and they would all just run away. It was a KGB police state. Of course, by the time I left in 92, uh, not only would they talk to you, but you couldn't get Russians to shut up. So it, it was a wonderful free expression. And and remember, as I know you would, when Gorbachev first ascended to power, he succeeded a long line of like calcified old party officials. I mean, it, it was just Jurassic Park inside the Kremlin and Gorbachev came in. But even so, people said he was just Stalin with a nicer smile. And he he had, I think, cultivated that harder image because how else could you 
rise in the Communist Party system except by playing the, the game. But as he became better known, learned about him, he knew something was rotten at the core of the Soviet system, and he set out to change it. And of course, the three famous things were glasnost, perestroika, and uskorenia, which I always translate as, as open it up, um, shake it up and speed it up. He really wanted to reform the, the, the system. And he went a long way to doing that, changed the world, of course, with the man for whom your institute's named, President Ronald Reagan, uh, but then was ousted before he got to really cross into the promised land. How long was it before you realized something was really changing there? Because as you just shared, when you were in Moscow, on behalf of the Chicago Tribune and you're covering it and people won't talk to you. It was the, the Soviet Union we all read about and think of in terms of this repressive closed regime. How long was it before you're like, wow, something is really kind of changing here, that this, this man really is different than the successors that you know, were kind of dying every couple of years from Brezhnev and you know, the others? Right. You know, Roger, that's a wonderful question. I wish I had a really pithy answer for you that I sat up in bed and elbowed my wife and said, dear, we have a front row seat at history changing. But it, it wasn't really that way. It was a slow evolution. As I said, he had to toe the party line. And he had all of the correct rhetoric about America being an aggressive power, the American system trying to constrain the Soviets, the President Reagan's strategic defense initiative, what we call Star Wars missile defense, was all about destroying the Soviet Union. But because I, I covered him, I got to travel with him, you know, not with him the way Americans travel with American presidents. But, you know, he went to New Delhi, uh, he made a trip to India, and he was just a different guy when he wasn't inside the Kremlin circle. You know, same thing, Geneva, Reykjavik, his summit in Washington. Oh my gosh, you might recall, he stopped his motorcade at K Street in Connecticut and got out and rushed into the crowd. And I'm sure no one was more surprised than his KGB bodyguards, but that's the kind of guy he was. And little by, by little, especially when he began to really act upon these reforms, the Glasnost reform, openness. He let books be published that hadn't been published. Art could, could flourish. And I always believe that you can define a society by what's allowed and what's not at the margins. And Gorbachev began embracing the margins. He began opening up immigration for Soviet Jews and devout Christians who wanted to leave. And of course, the central thing that showed all of us that was something was different was his growing relationship and warmth and respect with President Ronald Reagan. And the two of them, of course, changed world history. So let's let's talk about that. The two of them changing world history. And of course, Gorbachev passed away nine years, 91 years old this past August. You interviewed him, of course. Uh, I want to focus on one 2004 interview when he was in Washington for President Reagan's funeral. But before we go to that interview, what other kind of personal interaction did you have with Mikhail Gorbachev? Right. I hadn't had any one-on-one -on -one interviews before the one after he was retired, um, but he would routinely, or not routinely, he would often have press conferences where you could ask questions. And when one traveled with him to various summits, he would always stop and work the, the press. I once rode in an elevator with him, those sorts of things. I remember talking to him in on the India trip, his wife, Ra uh, Raisa Gorbachev, uh, was standing outside the the, the limousine waiting for him to come out of meetings. I just sort of began chatting her up and here's the communist party secretary coming to get into the limo with his wife and we exchanged pleasantries. So he was the first normal Soviet politician. That wouldn't have happened with Brezhnev, for example. No, absolutely not. Because <laughs> now we even know that some of Brezhnev's uh, press conferences from, from his office were actually in his hospital room where they just brought in the decor of, of a Kremlin office. So no, that would not have happened with Brezhnev. Amazing. So, so it's 2004, President Reagan's passed, Mikhail Gorbachev comes for the funeral, and you have the opportunity to interview Gorbachev. How did that come about and what was it kind of set the scene for us? Sure. You know, having covered those years, my perspective is not, you know, the opposite of the view of American national security reporters, but it was the yin to, to that yang. And so I made a very direct pitch to the Russian embassy, 
Uh, you know, Gorbachev is in town. Uh, I covered his entire time in office. I would like to speak with him about those years, especially to pose the question, because at that time, Roger, every obituary about uh, the late President Reagan said that Reagan won the Cold War. And that wasn't wrong. Please, I'm not trying to rewrite history, but I think you're, you're smiling. I think you know it was a little more complicated than that. And I wanted to, to give Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev a chance to talk about it. And I wasn't surprised, but I was very pleased when the embassy press office said, Tom, yes, come over. Uh, Gorbachev wants to talk to you. Well, and and that's the, the title of the piece, which I'm referencing. Without Gorbachev, Reagan wouldn't have won the Cold War. So take us through that line of argument and, and and the unique perspective, which of course would have been complementary to what the Russian embassy wanted and, and certainly what Gorbachev would want to speak about. But but take us to the argument and how Gorbachev uh, kind of embraced it or what was his particular line that demonstrated that this was, yes, I, I was I was the partner in this dance. Right, right. So, you know, these official interviews, they're, they're somewhat set piece. You sit down in overstuffed chairs, they serve tea, crackers, cheese, and all of that. And, and Gorbachev has the equivalent of a southern drawl. He's from so Sevastopol in southern Russia, and his political opponents used to make fun of him. I mean, he speaks, of course, beautiful Russian, but he speaks like a southerner. And we were sitting and chatting in this warm, sort of honey southern accent. And, you know, I posed the question directly. I said, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, every obituary being written right now talks about how Ronald Reagan won the Cold War. And he just cut me right off, Roger. And he said, it wasn't only that Reagan won the Cold War, I folded. Had there been any other leader inside the Kremlin at that time, one cannot imagine the Cold War ending as calmlessly and as bloodlessly as it did. Gorbachev folded a weak hand. So in no way am I saying that President Reagan was not the essential partner, but I think Gorbachev has been so overlooked for his self-sacrifice and statesmanship that changed the course of history, liberated a dozen countries to independent status, and you know really surrendered the Soviet empire as it had been envisioned for 80 years. And that, of course, is the narrative that Vladimir Putin has taken. And of course, you know, Gorbachev was is widely reviled by Putin's circle and by many average Russians, too. Well, we're going to talk about Putin and the reaction to Gorbachev. But it sounds to me like in that conversation, Gorbachev was reflecting on him folding as an act of strength, not an act of weakness. That's exactly, I mean, that's a very Zen statement. And I think that that's how he, he saw it, you know, because to have continued the fight really might have risked World War III or a possible, you know, weapons of mass destruction exchange at some point. And again, it, it wasn't only selflessness on Gorbachev's part. He, he never stopped believing in the Communist Party. His plans to accommodate Ronald Reagan weren't about ending the Soviet Union. He wanted to save the Soviet Union by reforming it, making it more effective. And he just knew that his reforms, especially his economic reforms, were impossible with the continued arms race with the United States. And so he wanted the end of hot tensions in the Cold War for his own selfish, important political reason. So he, he was it did he ever as a great point, did he ever reflect with you on whether he folded too quickly? from the standpoint of creating instability so that he was ousted. In other words, if he would have folded differently, he could have held on to power, maintained the Communist Party, and reform it in the fashion that you're sharing with us he intended. Right. That's a wonderful question. And I think that it did happen faster than he thought. But again, Roger, that wasn't his fault. I mean, let's remember the summer of 1991, there was an attempted coup because people, the, the hardliners around him, including the KGB boss and the chief of defense and many of the central committee members thought Gorbachev was going too fast. So they ousted him while he was away for summer vacation uh, in all places. Crimea. Dhaka, whatever, right? <laughs> he, he was down in the Crimea, which was the Communist Party vacation land. And we know how important that is today to Vladimir Putin as well. So summer of 91, they ousted him. It was a failed coup because the people at that point really liked Gorbachev's reform. They liked the 
steps toward freedom of speech, the, the economic opportunity playing with free enterprise. So the coup lasted only a matter of hours, but by then the forces had been unleashed. Boris Yeltsin became the man of the hour and pushed Gorbachev from office. So it's interesting to note that one should probably blame the failed coup plotters as much, if not more than Gorbachev, for accelerating it to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And of course, people take the streets. You have the choice of the Russian Soviet military not to in any way attack the protesters. That was the real moment. And then they're on the tanks and Yeltsin's there. And, and it seems to just all kind of go on from there. Although I, I did read uh, the uh, book on Jim Baker, of course, the Reagan's chief of staff and secretary of treasury. But of course, uh, he was secretary of state during Bush 41 when this is all happening. And the way that uh, President H.W. Bush chose to react to this, and it wasn't the equivalent of spiking the football, but being very measured in the reaction to what would become the collapse of the Soviet Union and figuring out how to make it all transition in, in the most peaceful way. Sitting in Moscow, and you're reporting on this for the Tribune, did you sleep at all during this time? I mean, it's just the stories are endless. You know, you don't. Isn't that one of those moments as a journalist we have to look for the story? It's it's hitting you in every direction, right? Well, and it hit me early. And it's funny you mentioned sleep. Um, uh, my wife and I were living in Moscow then with our uh, son, whose first birthday was in, in August, and so Sam uh, woke up teething. And Lisa went to, it was, it was her, her turn. And about five minutes later, she's waking me up in bed. She's saying, Tom, Tom, wake up. I've been listening to the BBC. Gorbachev's been ousted in, in a coup. And I said, dear, if you want me to get up with the baby, just say so. <laughs> that can't be true. It's really? Completely true. That's amazing. Well, because of our one-year-old teething who woke us up at two in the morning, because all the other reporters were asleep. And this is before, hard to imagine, before the internet. You couldn't even make direct dial telephone calls. So I got up, confirmed it because it was moving on tasks. So I got the coup in that morning's Chicago Tribune, because Chicago was nine hours behind. It was still ahead of deadline there, whereas many of the other reporters working for European and American papers slept through the coup. I'm sure their offices were dialing them madly, but Roger, it's hard to imagine that you could not make a direct dial phone call to the Soviet Union in 1991. And this coup, just an example of how ill-conceived it was, I imagine if you're actually carrying out a coup, you're trying to control the Western media within the country, right? And and the fact that you could call up and transmit the story is one, one example of how this thing was destined to fail. Well, although to be fair, we filed stories via telex back then. So the telex lines were still up, but I'm sure they were controlling international phone calls, just as you're saying, at least for the first few hours. Yeah, I mean, I guess take a step back. When you first moved to Moscow to become the correspondent during the Soviet Union, this is before, as you said earlier, Gorbachev became the Gorbachev we now remember. We think of it as, I don't know, Brezhnev Soviet Union or the you know, the Andropov or Chernyaka, whoever followed and died. You you had KGB watching everything you were doing, right? I mean, th th this was not exactly this is not a country that tolerated free press. Certainly, Western press. Give us a taste for what that means. We say these words, but what's the experience that you can point to just reflect that reality? Right. I mean, it's a great question, and there's two sides to it. One for an American correspondent during the time when the Soviet Union was a police state, it was probably the safest story you could cover because they didn't want any street random violence to come to you because street violence is an American problem, not a Soviet problem. So the KGB guys who followed us were in a weird way our bodyguards. At the same time, it corrupted every single relationship you had. Our Soviet staff people, with whom you come, become very warm, very friendly, they had to file reports on us every week. Everybody you had contact with, from officials to dissidents to refuseniks to underground musicians, were no doubt pressured because of you. 
because I was actively covering the dissident movement and especially the refusenik movement, those Soviet Jews who wanted to get to Israel or America but were refused, that was an issue of great importance to Chicago Tribune readers. Um, I was very active covering the stories. I came out one morning and my car had been hatcheted. Someone took a hatchet to it. And because I, you were just getting too close, reporting too much on the plight of refuseniks, people like Natan Sharansky and others who were a thorn in the side of, of the Soviet empire. Exactly. And if there was any thought that maybe this was random hooligan violence, a couple of days later, the Soviet newspaper, Sovietska Kultura, ran a full page denunciation of me. And the headline was, Where the Silver Volvo Hurries. And it was a list, Roger. It was incredible. Of like all of my meetings with refuseniks over the past year, they had followed me. They had harassed the refuseniks I met with. Of course, they were very courageous and didn't stop. But it was a laundry list of what a bad boy I had been in their minds. And I thought it was interesting because at that point, the Chicago Tribune was the fifth largest newspaper in America. So my denunciation wasn't in Pravda or Zvestia. It was in the fifth largest Soviet newspaper. That Amazing. Correlation. That's how much they thought through their, their, their jack boot of authority. So much of the focus, when you think about Reagan and Gorbachev, you focus on nuclear negotiations, you know, Reykjavik and the opportunity to uh, have an arms control negotiation, reduction, treaties and the like. But what you were just hitting on, the plight, the human rights element, the plight of, of, of people who just didn't have political freedom and religious freedom. That was very important to Reagan. Um, if you look at his uh, letters, uh, or actually his diaries, he ref first thing he asked Brezhnev in his own hand, not the State Department written letter, his first communication to Soviet leaders is, is the plight of Sharansky, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, throughout. And this irritated the Soviet Union to no end. What was Gorbachev's orientation? Did he view it cynically as just uh, an attempt by another U.S. president to embarrass and shame the Soviet Union with human rights abuses? Or did they think there was something genuine, something really going to the core of humanity uh, that he understood and, and wanted to work with him on? Right. The historic record shows that at their first meeting in Geneva, the Geneva summit between uh, Reagan and Gorbachev in 85, I think November, there were four baskets of issues, arms control and this and that. And one of them was human rights. And, you know, it's important to remember that the two of them did not become, you know, best buds right away. It was an evolving relationship. And Gorbachev was quite angry that Reagan pressed that. And of course, always countered with the treatment of indigenous Americans, you know, and um, African Americans and women. So the Soviets had their talking points about human rights issues back here. But obviously, Gorbachev over time became the man who did loosen the restrictions on immigration for Jews and Christians and artists and others. So I think he did acknowledge the importance of recognizing the human spirit, but he wanted to control it. And I don't think any world leader likes to be lectured by another world leader. But lest any of your listeners think that I'm pro Gorby and anti-Reagan, that's not it at all. President Reagan was a, a brilliant strategist wherever it came from. And we talked about Star Wars, the Strategic Defense Initiative earlier, which nobody felt was ever going to be this impervious dome protecting America. But the effect was incredible because the years I was there, that is what really terrified the Soviet leadership the most. But it wasn't that the U.S. was going to bomb them back to the Stone Age. It was that the U.S. was going to spend them back to the Stone Age. So that was really understood. It's not something that the archives have revealed later on that was really happening. That It was almost something that you could pick up on. I mean, that by the time uh, Gorbachev gets to Reykjavik for this summit and you know they're or preparing for a summit, I should say, he Famously, Gorbachev puts SDI, the Star Wars program, on the table, and, and Reagan rejects it. He's happy to negotiate away all the nuclear weapons on both sides. That is Reagan. But SDI, which President Reagan, of course, viewed as a way to ensure 
we had a means to keeping nuclear weapons out of this world. And he was prepared to share it with the Soviet Union. That was the issue because the Soviets knew they couldn't keep up with the research and development, with the, the know-how. That's exactly right. And even if Star Wars was never going to work, there was a deep concern and you know, Soviet officials would kind of whisper it to you that the U.S. would find some new breakout technology because they so respected U.S. research, development, testing, and evaluation. So even if it was never going to be an impervious missile shield, who knows what the U.S. might find as far as a breakout weapon that would render the Soviet Union, you know, uh, at the U.S. mercy. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, Tom, and I want to move to Ukraine here in, in a second, and, and there's strong, strong links. We'll, we'll do that. But I was just had a uh, recorded a, a podcast with a young uh, scholar at AEI who's coming out with a book called Chip War, and talking about how the history of semiconductors and, and, and chips, but particularly it was the United States advancement in microelectronics that really spooked the Soviets. Right. In part, they believed that SDI would happen or would reveal something that would give the United States a significant security advantage because they were so far behind in microelectronics and they thought the United States could actually do something because they had produced such advances in precision, munitions, and the like. That's exactly right. There's a string of Soviet era jokes, which might not translate today, but if you visit Moscow, they show you the largest bell that was ever forged, the largest cannon ever made, and the largest microchip ever pr produced. <laughs> exactly. All right. For everybody, for those who are not um, um, semiconductor microchip experts, experts, the smaller the chip, the better. Um, and uh, it's kind of like the dinosaur age. If it's if it's large, uh, Tom Shanker, wonderful to have you on the show. Uh, long time national security correspondent for the New York Times. Now, of course, with George Washington University director of their project for media and national security. Let's talk about another facet of your time as a correspondent for the Chicago Tribune, of course, where you were prior to the New York Times, uh, when you, of course, were observing Mikhail Gorbachev and the actual um, demise of the Soviet Union. Tell us about Ukraine. Of course, you have these captive nations, these nations that were behind the Iron Curtain, that, of course, were just subject to the Iron Fist of the Soviet Union. And then we have this coup, Soviet Union falls, right? Um, and all of a sudden we have these new nations seeking recognition. Where does Ukraine fit in all this, Tom? Right, you know, Ukraine, and again, it's so relevant today, Ukraine is the breadbasket of the old Soviet Union. Uh, it had the most, uh, the richest veins of coal and all other things. So it's always been an essential part of both the Tsar's empire and the Soviet Union. But as you said so correctly, after the coup of August 19, 1991 failed, all of these countries saw an opportunity to be free. And let's recall that you know a year or two before, all of the Warsaw Pact states had become free, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, the others. And the Soviet republics wanted the same freedom. And so uh, it happened in unimaginable speed. So one of the proudest stories I ever covered was Ukraine's vote for independence in August of 1991. Uh, the anniversary was just you know a month ago, and it's worth noting that Putin began the buildup of forces to invade Ukraine a year ago, August, on the anniversary, the 20th anniversary. I'm sorry, the 30th, 30th anniversary. Yeah. Um, and Putin believes in anniversaries. So it's a, it was a moment of, of hope and opportunity. And to be sure, we have to be clear-eyed. Ukraine has suffered from corruption, and it has problems through it's history. It's been a bumpy road it's in been the direction of freedom and its relationship with Moscow, for sure. Exactly, and with the West as well. But nonetheless, I think all right-thinking people believe that a population of a country should be able to direct itself and not be ruled from Moscow. So it was a very, very powerful moment. So it was this moment of self-determination where the people could decide if they wanted to be an independent state or something else. In August of 1991, take us back there, Tom Shanker, was it a, really a choice for the people living in Ukraine? Were there some who said... You know what? I'd still like to be tied to Russia. 
Uh, I certainly didn't meet many of them. But again, in Kiev, the capital, which is Ukrainian for sure, they had been looking for independence for years and years and years. To be fair, there are areas in eastern Ukraine that have a higher percentage of Russians. But at that point, you know, they just thought, you know, a freer economy, freedom to travel and all of that. Putin, of course, has built on the Russian minorities to make his case for the land grab. But I don't think anybody really wanted to remain in the old Soviet Union. And then, of course, from 1991, fast forward to Vladimir Putin. Putin, of course, is famous for saying that the saddest day in his lifetime was the breakup of the Soviet Union. This is someone who looked at Mikhail Gorbachev as a failure. So much of Putin's reign is about restoring, correcting for the mistakes in his view of Gorbachev. We started this conversation reflecting on your relationship or interview with, with Gorbachev and, and being a correspondent in Moscow when the Soviet Union fell. When did Putin first get on your radar screen? Well, I'll tell you a story that's a little embarrassing, but there's no reason not to. Oh, now we're all listening. Eyes peeled, ears tuned in. Right. So I actually met Putin before he became Putin. Um, back in the Soviet era, there were all of these sister city relationships. They were kind of love and friendship and peace, and they still have them now. And so Leningrad was the Soviet second city, as was Chicago, America's second city. So I used to routinely go to Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, to do stories about trade delegations, art trades, and all of that. And uh, the mayor of St. Petersburg, Leningrad, was Anatoly Sobchak one of the first senior notable officials to stand up against the coup. And he was vital to overturning the, the coup because Leningrad was a major arms depot, large military garrison. Sobchak would not approve it to move against the protesters. And after Putin became Putin, he became prime minister, president, prime minister. I went back to my notebooks and in about a dozen meetings with Mayor Sobchak, I looked at, at the bottom and among the aides and advisors was one Putin, comma, Vladimir V, who was Sobchak's um, foreign policy advisor. Putin was in the KGB. He wasn't the KGB handler. He was an advisor. Exactly right. Putin was a mid-level KGB officer in East Germany. After East Germany and the West were reunified, he came home and he was actually very dissatisfied with the KGB. And so he looked for jobs in the political sector and signed on with Sobchak as his foreign policy and foreign trade advisor. But here's the thing. His spycraft training, Roger, was so thorough. John le Carre once wrote that the best spy is someone you can miss in a crowd of two. And that was Vladimir Putin. And I've talked to a lot of diplomats and senior officials who met him back in the day. They don't remember him at all. That's how good he was at just being invisible. And of course, now he's the opposite of, of invisible. Yeah, he's certainly come out of his shadow, huh? Exactly. But he left very few clues along the way as to the kind of Putin he would become. Are you surprised, given this arc, Tom Schenker, correspondent for the Chicago Tribune, arriving in Moscow, 1986, around that time? 85, yeah. 85. You see the, the fall of the empire, the emergence of modern Russia now. Are you surprised that we have this revanchist power invading neighbors, not just with respect to Ukraine. That's that's the one that's gotten bloody and we have a war in our hands. But this, of course, happened in Georgia as well and in and, and, and Ukraine with respect to Crimea. So does this at all surprise you in terms of the situation we find ourselves in with a Putin-led Russia invading neighbors? Right. So I'm I'm sad and, and sorrowful. And there's one group of Russians we haven't talked about, which are all of the Russians who were able to leave under Gorbachev and make new lives in Israel and the UK and the US. And of all of the Russians who, who don't like Gorbachev's legacy, believe me, they love Gorbachev's legacy because they got to start new, new lives. And I have a lot of these Russian emigre friends here, and I'm very close in touch with them. And none of us are surprised at what Putin is doing. Once he became a public figure, 
once Putin became Putin, he didn't hide anything. He gave a very famous speech in, in Munich, 2006, 2007, at the Munich Security Conference. Secretary Gates was in the front row. John McCain was in the front row. And Putin came out and basically laid out his grievances against the West and his plans for reestablishing Russian hegemony in the near abroad. Again, Putin is not a communist. He doesn't want global domination or any of those cliches. He's more like a new czar than a new communist party boss. He just wants the Russian empire reestablished. And a year after that Munich speech, invasion of, of, of Georgia. Yeah, we have, this, we have Georgia, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, and to this day are still occupied by and controlled by, by Russia. Exactly right, Roger. So am I surprised? No, not at all, because it was all there for us to read. And those of us who spent time there knew sort of how those politics were feared for the worst. But of course, I'm extremely saddened that this is where the world is today. And that's why, again, the Reagan-Gorbachev relationship is, is so important to remember and to understand what made that dynamic possible. I mean, those are two great men of history in the fullest sense of, of that phrase. You think about President Reagan, one of the things he always said, uh, repeated throughout his career, I think the first time made very public was his inauguration speech as governor. But freedom is never more than a generation away from extinction, right? This notion that it needs to be fought for in every generation. And here we are, you know, as we were talking about, just 30 plus years after he left office, 30 years since the Soviet Union fell, we are back in this clash between West and East, between Russia and the United States. And of course, it's ground zero is, is a former Soviet Republic, Ukraine right now, but it's been going on for since 2008, in, t in terms of Putin's uh, invading neighbors and, and seeking to control his, his near abroad. Let's talk a little bit about the conflict, because you're a keen watcher of security issues, of how militaries operate, and then they fight. At this moment that we're recording, Tom, Ukraine has the initiative. They're advancing into the Donbass. They're taking territory that Putin's military took at the beginning of the conflict in February. What's your assessment? Are you surprised specifically with how poorly the Russian military has performed? Their conventional power seems to not be at all what we expected. Poorly trained troops, troops, excuse me, the equipment not operating. Uh, they're not trained on it effectively. And then you have what we expect to be a ragtag Ukrainian military operating very effectively and 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 not uh, in any way seem to be yielding to uh, Russian metal. What, what's your take on all this, Tom, and, and what you expect it to hold? So I don't want to get too wonky on you here, but I will quote Clausewitz just this one. Oh, Clausewitz, okay. <laughs> Clausewitz wrote about how any state power is based both on the blade and on the hilt, the handle. And the handle is the public, the, the soul, the commitment, and the blade is the weapon. And Ukraine has proven that the hilt, the spirit of the people, is more important than the blade because the blade can be fixed or imported from the West or whatever metaphor you want to use. The Russian forces, as you said, Roger, they have a hollow, crumbly hilt, and the blade turned out to not be as sharp as, as people thought as well. And, you know, U.S. intelligence... Uh, and the military, DIA, the Pentagon, they have always overestimated adversaries. I guess that's safer than underestimating them. But even during the Reagan era, it's like the Soviets were 10 feet tall and all that sort of stuff. And it's so interesting to note as far as spirit, um, you know, I don't want to get into the debate about domestic immigration law, but if you look at which way people flow, mm. people want to flow into the United States because we are a shining, despite our problems, and there are many, we are still a place people want to leave, to want to live. And as we're talking today, Roger, there are lines 10 miles long at border crossings trying to get out of Russia to avoid Putin's draft. That has to tell the world something. So lines 10 miles long of these, we have the Putin draft trying to get these reservists to restore Russian lines in Ukraine, and they're, they're seeking the exits 
who this is a man who's clearly isolated, yeah. right? What I mean by that is he's the autocrat and people he has around him generally tell him, I assume what they want, what he wants to hear. Right. Is that what's going on here that Putin thought he had this cutting edge military, highly trained and, and it's just people around him lying to him because that's what they do. It's not a good idea to tell a despot something he does not want to hear. I think as they were planning this war, I think they weren't lying. I think they really thought that President Zelensky of Ukraine would flee and that the capital could be encircled and captured. And they had no idea of the fighting spirit and creativity of the Ukrainians, nor did they expect the United States and the NATO allies to hang together so strongly and rush all of the weapons that have made the difference. So let's not, in for a moment, um, not you know salute the Ukrainian fighting spirit, ingenuity, bravery. But if the West had not rushed those weapons in, it'd be a very different war. And that's why you asked about what happens next. You know, it's up to the Ukrainians. I mean, there's discussion about what's the compromise point, what's the negotiation. That's not for us to say. That's for the Ukrainians. But they do run the risk of overextending their own front lines. Let's talk about this for a couple more minutes, and I want to talk about the media layer and all of this. But the way geopolitics works and great power competition works, and particularly the way Europe works, it's not just going to be the Ukrainians that determine what the terms of negotiation will be. Because as Vladimir Putin flexes not the muscle of trying to get a ragtag military of recruits over into Ukraine, but flexes the nuclear muscle, tactical nuclear weapons, which the world knows and Europe knows he has and he's invested in. And it's probably prudent to assume they work, but whether they work or they don't work, it's a dangerous scenario. Right. The politics of the Cold War were the same. The Western Europeans were not interested in doing anything that would force the hands of the Soviets. I got to expect there are the Germans and perhaps voices inside the Biden administration here in Washington, D.C., who do not want to put Vladimir Putin in a position where he thinks he's got his back against the wall, that he has to exercise kind of nuclear diplomacy. Right. And early in the conflict, the White House even made statements that, you know, Zelensky's going to have to compromise. Part of Ukraine will go to Russia. That's the only way to reach an end game here. They quickly withdrew, though, those comments. And now the talking point is it's up to the Ukrainians. But the pressures on all of the Western countries, Roger, not just fear of tack nukes, but winter's coming. And it's going to be a long, cold winter. So you're talking about the energy the diplomacy, right? And and diplomacy, right? And again, you know, I I live here in the Washington D.C. area, and it's very heartwarming to see all of the, you know, yellow and blue flags flying to support Ukraine. And please don't take this the wrong way, people who fly those flags. But it takes a little more than putting a sticker on your window and a flag over your door to help the Ukrainians right now. And I'm just really afraid that this feel good support is going to wane over time. Well. The United States standing with a people that wants to maintain its freedom and protect its borders. That makes sense from our values. That makes sense uh, in terms of the geopolitics we want to preserve in the world. Uh, Congress, of course, is going to incorporate, it looks like, more funding for Ukraine. But that will be the center of gravity in terms of whether the United States truly is willing to support Ukraine. President Biden and his administration have asked for the funds. So now it's over to a, a Congress to see if they're going to appropriate the funds for it so far They've been able to get the funds through, although not without uh, certain members in the Congress saying, you know, balking for one reason or another. Uh, Tom, one layer in this conflict, which has received a fair amount of attention, it's a key kind of element in the conflict, is media. And what in the old day they would call propaganda, but now it's information operations, this notion that you're trying to control the narrative and weaken the resolve of your adversary through media. You're focusing on that, at least in part, at George Washington University. Give us a, a, a take on how critical and, and how much of focus this line is in, in the conflict. Sure. Roger, I've learned so much covering the military. I know you have too. And whenever you want to understand a complicated problem, it's good to divide it into the tactical, operational, and strategic. So at the strategic level of information operations, Putin's been extremely effective at convincing a vast majority of his countrymen 
that Ukraine is a proto-Nazi state, which is despite just, the Jewish president, it's a proto-Nazi state. <laughs> That's effective information operations. Exactly right. And let's be honest: during World War II, there were Ukrainian partisans who very much cooperated with the Nazis in rounding up Jews and herding them into death camps and others. But as you and I know, and all thinking people, current present day Ukraine is not a proto-Nazi state. But because of the vast Russian losses in World War II, that resonates. And it really is a powerful driver of his population at the strategic level. Countering that is, as you said, the president of, of Ukraine, a former comedian, Jewish, who has been extremely effective First of all, he didn't flee like people thought, and he has been such an image of strength and resolve, and he has used mass media. I mean, he spoke to a joint session of Congress. He speaks to the UN. He speaks to NATO. He's thoughtful. He's wearing, you know, military fatigues in a way that wasn't like Gaddafi with the ribbons. I mean, he is wearing the clothes of a Ukrainian fighter. So at the strategic level, both have been effective at opposite ends. At the operational level, it's very interesting how new media has played a role. I mean, the first report that Russian tanks had crossed into Ukraine came from a professor at the Middlebury Institute in Monterey, California, whose students had been monitoring GPS and saw a gigantic traffic jam at a border crossing where they knew Russian tanks had been staged. So I'm sure CIA, NSA, DIA were watching from their satellites, but Putin can do very little right now that does not become public knowledge very, very quickly. One follow-up on that. Please. Uh, just th That recalls this notion of deterrence by disclosure, this idea that you could prevent Vladimir Putin from taking an action if the whole world says, I see you, we're watching, we know what you're up to. Does that work? Well, you know, we can criticize American intelligence for all kinds of flaws, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, but I, I think the CIA or the community writ large deserves a, a, a plus for how it very carefully released intelligence on Putin's buildup to convince the world that this was for real. Um, again, some of us who saw the real Putin saw it less a year ago that this was starting and believed it. But I think nobody who has seen the intelligence and was thinking over the months before the war would have been thinking, oh, he's he's just flexing his muscles. He's, he's not going in. I mean, little details like one of the intelligence releases was that Putin had moved field hospitals to, to the front. You're a, a defense expert. Field hospitals are very complicated things to move, very expensive. Uh, manpower, personnel, power intensive, you don't move field hospitals right. unless you think you're going to need them. And that sort of was incredibly convincing. It didn't deter Putin, but it certainly might have changed his thinking and timelines. Tom Schenker, we're going to wrap up here and go to our lightning round. But before we do, we'll ask you not just to play the part of former journalist, correspondent, editor, but now you got to be the prognosticator. A year from now, we're back together in Reaganism. Will this conflict still be going on? This is going to sound terrible, but I think if the conflict is still going on in this frozen state, that's not the best outcome, Roger, but it's not the worst. I would hate for us to have this conversation a year from now after tactical nu nuclear weapons had been used for the first time. Um, you know, a, a, a disaster, a, a human disaster, an environmental disaster beyond imagination. So, so some sort of frozen conflict with a with a border that's disputed, but uh, the live fire is, we hope, potentially is is uh, suppressed or not the levels that we're witnessing. Right. I'm not hoping for for that, but that is not the worst thing that that could happen versus exchange of nuclear weapons. Fantastic. Tom Schenger, former correspondent for the Chicago Tribune in Moscow from 1986 through the end of the Cold War in 1991, then longtime national security correspondent for the New York Times and then the editor of the New York Times and now at George Washington University, director for Project for Media and National Security, as well as a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council where he reflected on his interview and time with Miguel Gorbachev, uh, all of which makes him eminently uh, certified, <laughs> qualified to be yeah, on Reaganism. I, I, I am certifiable. You, <laughs> I opened myself up on that one, didn't I? All right, let's go to the lightning round where we ask our guests to share their favorite Reagan book. 
Reagan speech or Reagan quote? You give us all three, two, or just one, Tom. What do you have to share? What a great question. I would say one of the most compelling is from that Geneva summit in 85 that we talked about. As you know, they were behind closed doors, and Reagan suggested that he and Gorbachev go for a walk in the woods, translators only, no other officials. And very little from that conversation was known until Gorbachev gave an interview many, many years later. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Reagan asked Gorbachev was, if we were invaded by aliens, if men from Mars attacked the U.S., would you come to our aid? And Gorbachev said, of course I would. And would you come to ours? And Reagan said, of course we would. And while that's a funny science fiction story, we can laugh, but it was that greater sense of shared threat, shared risk, common concern that is missing from world politics today, whether it's pandemic, climate change, mm. mass migration, whatever. I wish we could get leaders on all sides who would see common shared risk that we should fight in a common front and not all these things that divide us. Tom Shanker, thank you so much for being on the show and, and sharing those real insightful memories and experiences with us. Honored to be here, Roger. Great discussion. Best of luck in your important work. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Reaganism. New episodes premiere weekly every Monday on YouTube and all podcast streaming platforms. If you like this episode, be sure to let us know and share with a friend. Thank you.